So the next talk is by uh, Kaveh Singh. Uh, he'll be telling us about Craig Nice's uh, approach to pseudo-random generators from polarizing random walks. And I should mention that some, some of the uh, techniques in, in, in this work were uh, used by uh, Avishay uh, in uh, his work that he'll be telling us about after lunch. Thank you very much. Um, so this is a joint work with Ishan Chaitupetye and Puya Hatami and Shahar Lave. Um, I'm going to introduce pseudorandom generators quickly and describe this new approach to construct pseudorandom generators and then describe some open problems. So just to set up the form, some basic notation, let's say we have a class of functions, f, that are defined on some domain d and take real values. And you can think of these as class of tests that are supposed to test something. And we have the truly random object on this domain, which is just the random variable that takes uniform values. <coughs> and now we have another random variable, x, defined on this domain, d. And then we call this x to be epsilon pseudorandom, or I say x epsilon fools this class. If for every function in my family, the average of the function when I apply it to x is very close to the average on uniform random variable. Um, but usually, the interesting case is when you pick the domain to be the Boolean cube, and I pick uh, to be this way, minus 1, 1 to the n. Later, you will see why do I pick this, this specific choice of numbers. But so we just stick with this domain. Um, so the goal is to construct this random variable. And by that, I mean I just need an algorithm to sample this random variable, and it has to have I need to use few coin flips as possible in the construction. And also, the, alg the algorithm should be explicit, depending on whatever model you're working with. So you can formalize this by saying you have this function g that takes s bits, s truly random bits, and gives you n bits that n is much larger than s. And your random variable x would be g applied to uniform random variable on s bits. Um, and I call this s to be a seed length. Oh, this was the basic notation. So let me just give you an example. Let's say we take the class of tests to be all linear characters of this space f2 to the n. So that means you take all monomials that are multilinear. For every subset of 1 up to n, you have a multilinear monomial. And your function is just all of this class the class of all of these monomials. And uh, x, if you have a random variable x that epsilon fools this class, we call that epsilon bias random variable. So we will use this later. And this is also, uh, there are optimal construction for this is basically known, and they take log n or epsilon n bits. Um, OK, so let me just quickly describe some general approaches to construct pseudo-random generators. Um, so one idea is to take these basic pseudo-random generators, like epsilon bias generator or k-wise independence, and just uh, combine them in a simple way to give you PRGs for stronger classes. For example, this is a result of Viola that showed if you add up d many epsilon biased random variables, you can fool degree d f2 polynomials. <coughs> um, so this is one line of work. Another is based on random restriction, which is closer to the approach that I'll be talking about. This was initiated by Itai and Wigderson. And the idea is to do the following. In the first step, you have your class of functions. It's a specific function class. And then you want to show that when you apply random restriction to this function class, your function class simplifies. By that, I mean you pick many of the variables randomly and assign minus 1, 1 values to it randomly. Um, so you have to do the, the step two is to de-randomize this statement. And by that, I mean you have to show the following. Under pseudo-random restrictions, again, also, the function class should simplify. And that would mean that you get a pseudo-random generator for this function class. But one problem with this approach is that usually, even if you were able to show this, 
step one. Step two is usually difficult and it gets really complicated to switch random with pseudo random here. And it depends heavily on the, t on the specific function class that you choose. And, um, and yeah, so it could, get, it could get complicated. And one of the consequences of the current work that I'll be describing, uh, okay, so this one thing that you can, for this function class, you can basically take circuits or branching programs or more special cases of those. Um, so one of the consequences of the current work is that we give a generic method to do this step two. So we don't really need to look at what function class are we giving. It's just a more general approach that it works for every function class. If it satisfies one. And this is just one of the consequences, actually. And it turns out that you can do much more than this. So I will describe this later. OK, so but to explain the approach, I have to first introduce an intermediate object, and which is a more relaxed version of a pseudorandom generator. And that is what we call a fractional pseudorandom generator. So what was the pseudorandom generator? We had this cube, this minus 1 to the n cube. And you have a function that takes values on the vertices of the cube. If you have any function of this form, you can just multilinearly extend this function to over all of Rn. Right? So you get a unique multilinear polynomial. And, but we're only interested in inside of the values inside of this cube. So we only take, we look at only minus 1, 1 to the n, this whole cube. And it's easy to see that just because the vertices were taking minus 1, 1 values, inside the cube, the function will also take values minus 1, 1. Um, the one easy way to see is that look at this particular line, and the function is just completely linear here. And it, its boundary is between minus 1, 1. So it has to be between minus 1, 1 on the boundary. And you can just continue this argument. OK. so. Um, so now let's go back to the definition of pseudorandom generator. What did it mean? I claim that this now, I have take the average of my function applied to this random variable x, and I just want to compare it to the value of the function defined at the center. This is because this was previously average over the uniform, and average over the uniform is just f applied to the average of uniform. An average of uniform is just the center. This is because the function is multilinear. Okay. Um, <coughs> so now we have to relax this definition. The only thing to relax about this is to say your random variable is allowed to take arbitrary values between minus 1, 1. So that I call fractional PRG. Let's say. And that could mean that your distribution could be over these points inside the cube. But there is one problem with this relaxation, and that is this: I could just take the center uh, to be my random variable. It's constant always, and it's always f of a 0. So epsilon would be 0. So that would be my trivial pseudorandom generator. But, uh, but we have to so we'll rule out this case later in order for it to be useful. So now there are two questions about this. One is that, is this relaxation helping you in any way? So can you construct these fractional pseudo-random generators even more easily here? And uh, can you use these, pseudo -random, these fractional versions to get standard pseudo-random generators? Um, so let me uh, explain the second question first. Uh, so OK, so now the question is, I have this random variable that has this property, but it's on minus 1, 1. And I get, want to get a random variable x prime on the vertices of the cube. So the main idea is that we want to do a random walk that fairly uh, fastly, it converges to the vertices of the cube. And But I want to use my. I want to use this random, this fractional PRG, and that I'll use it to do my random walk. So I use it as steps for my random walk. I will explain what I mean by this. Um, okay. 
So let's uh, first rule out the trivial PRG. So I have this random variable x that it's on n coordinates, x1 up to xn. And I don't want it to be trivial. So I enforce that on every variable, typically my random variable is not 0. So it's bounded away from 0, typically. So I have a constant p that for every coordinate, this average of uh, the square of my random variable is bounded below by p. Okay, so here's our main theorem. You have a fun arbitrary function class on n variables. We need this extra technical condition that your function class has to be closed under restriction. That this is pretty much every function class satisfies. Every interesting class of function satisfies this. And uh, you have any fractional pseudorandom generator. So it's any distribution that satisfies this property. And it's also non-trivial in the sense that there is a p so that this happens. Then there is an x prime. Then there is a function g. And before that, then you can use t copies of this fractional pseudorandom generator. So I use t independent copies. And I have a function that I apply it to these t copies, and I get this x prime, which is a standard pseudorandom generator. And if the original error was epsilon, the error here is epsilon t. And so the only thing to say is you don't need to use too many independent copies. And the independent copies, the number would be 1 over p log of n over epsilon, where p was this lower bound. Um, so I'm using t independent copies. If I originally, for the fractional PRG, I had s bits, then now I just use the seed length would be t times s. Okay, so let me just describe the main idea um, for this uh, theorem. Again, we want to do a random walk. So let's say, let's see what we have. We have this fractional PRG. What does it mean? It means basically that you have the center. This is f of 0. And it's as if I'm saying that I'm taking one random step from the center. And typically, the value of my function doesn't change. That's what it says. So if we could continue this process, if we could, um, I know I came here, the value didn't change typically. So if I continue doing a random walk and converge to one of the vertices, then that would be great. But, so I, let's say I took this random step. But I want to continue this. <coughs> but now the question is, can I really continue? Can I, again, take a step and say the value didn't change? But um, <coughs> well, the, the thing is, this only talks about difference from the center. So I cannot just directly use this. Uh, but uh, but I, if I knew somehow that this new point is center of some other cube for some other function that still my PRs, fractional PRG works for, then I would be in good shape. So what's the natural thing to do is just look at a subcube that this is in the center. And so look at the largest <coughs> subcube, then this is the center inside this big cube. So this is my subcube. And this is now the center. But now I have to, um, I had my original pseudorandom generator. I have to also scale that. So I had my distribution. Now I'm scaling it here. I didn't explain. So I'm just now assuming this my this PRG with just, let's say, some distribution over these four points. Um, OK, so now I have this. Then I can, why, so what's the question? Now the question is, if I can do take another step here, then the func function doesn't change much. And that is because you can see this easily that this new function that's defined on this subcube is actually in the convex hall of restrictions of the original function that you started with. So since we know our class is closed under restriction, then we know that this new function is in this convex hall. And if it's in the convex hall, then the PRG should also work for that. Yes? 
Are the coordinates scaled differently in each dimension? Yes. So, yeah, I mean, just completely independently. Everything happens in coordinate wise independent. Because at the end of the day, on each coordinate, I want to be very close to minus one and one. Okay, so let me. Okay, so now the question is why this would converge fast to one of the vertices. So the, the idea is that continue doing this, for example. Like now I'm here, take another step. Now look at this, the cube that has this to be the center, which is this one. Now I take a step from here. You know, let's take it from here, and then so on, I continue. And this whole cube, as you can see, converges to one of these vertices. But we want to say that it should happen fast, so there shouldn't be too many steps. Um, so the idea for the fast convergence is that because every coordinate, everything happens independently, I just need to show this for one coordinate only. And so let's, let's prove this. This is lemma, the lemma that I want to prove. Now I have a random walk on just one coordinate, so it's on minus 1, 1. And um, at the, in the beginning, I'm at the center. And I have this random variable y sub t which is the location at step t. And uh, how do I do this? So originally, I had this fractional PRG, which was this random variable on minus 1, 1. Right? So I'm at step t minus 1. And I look at the largest cube that this is the center. That means that the length of the cube would be this, because this is a distance from the boundary. And I scale my fractional PRG step, because this was a number that could be between minus 1, 1. So I have to scale this by this number, so this whole thing stays between minus 1, 1. OK? And so this is my just this random walk. So that step gets scaled as we get closer to the boundary. And the only assumption I have is that the random variable x that I pick independently <coughs> from is also symmetric, so its average is 0. And we want to say that the following, that if this random variable x was typically not 0, so if, basically, anyway, so look at, this is the number of steps that you have to take. 1 over average of x squared, and so only need log of 1 over epsilon. Do, do you not need the bound? Oh, oh I see, that, that covers the bound. And you say after this many steps, with high probability, the distance from the boundary would be less than epsilon. Um, OK, so let's just quickly see this. Basically, this is basically the whole proof. So it's, you can basically check case by case, and you get this inequality, that the distance from the boundary at step i is always less than distance from the boundary at step i minus, I minus 1 times 1 minus xi. Which xi is an independent new copy of x that I'm using. So this is independent. You can take average. Now the problem is this average, because this was symmetric, this average is just 1. So this is not helping me much. But if you take the square root of this random variable, Okay, so what the, thing, the thing that's helping me here is that average of the square root of 1 minus xi is bounded above by something less than 1. Because uh, you, just, you can just write the Taylor expansion of the square root of 1 minus x, and then you can write this down. And this is, uses the fact that x was symmetric because I'm not, I don't have the linear term. So uh, now I get a constant c <coughs> that is of this form. And I get this bound on this. So what, what does it mean? I just write average of square root of 1 minus sub 1 minus sub i is bounded by its step i minus 1 times 1 minus c. And this is so you can see at i steps, this is exponentially small. So that's basically the proof. Oh, and so now that. We are very close to the boundary. We can just round the value to, to the sign of yt. 
Um, so this was how you can, this was for only one coordinate. You just union bound over every coordinate and get this to be closed in every coordinate. And um, so now the question is, can we construct these fractional PRGs easier than standard PRGs? Um, so there's one very general, very weak assumption about class of functions that's about their growth of uh, Fourier coefficients. And I'll describe that. And it turns out that you get a very easy fractional PRG for this white class of functions that was not known before. Um, so, the, so the definition for a coefficient is this. You just, for every subset of 1 up to n, you, the average of your function, the correlation with this monomial. And then we say this function f has bounded Fourier growth. If you look at all the Fourier characters of Hemingway exactly k, for every k, and you just add up all of those, this is bounded by some constant, some parameter c to the k. Okay, so this, I call this, so the only thing that is important is parameter c, the better bound you get for c. Um, so for example, you can just always take c to be n. Okay, so, so how can we construct a fractional PRG for this class? So I have an arbitrary class of functions that the only thing I know about every function in the family is this. OK, so the idea is the following. You just have pick a epsilon bias friend variable. And uh, so again, just to remind you, this was the average of, for every subset of s to the 1 up to n, this average was less than epsilon. And, uh, I scale this epsilon bias random variable. This is a random variable on minus 1 to 1 to the n, but I don't need this. I just need some fractional PRG. So I just scale this to be something inside the cube. So I have a parameter, okay. I have a parameter c, and I just scale this by 1 over 2 c, where c was this thing. So now the x is taking all, always taking value between in minus one, one or two c and one or two c. <coughs> okay, so let's see why this works. It's again very simple. What is what do we want to bound? We want to bound the average of f of x minus f of zero. So this was f of zero. So it's, we just removed the trivial Fourier coefficient. The rest is just exactly this. And you can just write down this and put the absolute values inside. And just now use the definition of this xi, this x, which was just scaling of y. So I just write down this. And now I use my assumption on the level k. So I add up all the level k's here. So OK, we knew this is less than epsilon. And now you add up all the level k's. And this is 1 over 2 to the k. And this is less than epsilon. So we have now this fractional PRG. But now this was the scaling of this thing, right? Um, okay. This was the scaling. And its average is, if you look at average of x squared on every coordinate, it would be like 1 over some constant times c squared, right? Because these are the values. Because this takes values of 1 over 2c and 1. Yeah. OK. So basically, you can, this is the number of steps that we have to do to construct the original, the standard pseudo random generator. And this is the seed length for the, for the epsilon biased. This is actually not epsilon biased, it's almost k wise, because you don't really need this bound on all of the Hamming weights. You can just. Epsilon almost k would would be enough. So this would be the total seed length for your function family. So the only interesting parameter here is c. So if you just give me any function family and you can prove a good bound on c, then you would just in a black box way would give you this seed length. So for example, this paper proves 
something that a consequence of it is that you can pick for functions of sensitivity s, you can pick c to be s here. Okay, for something stronger, but this is all we need. Um, so if you just plug in this, it would give you c length s squared times log that. And this improves this previous result, result significantly by Puyan and Avishai, which was uh, 2 to the square root n, 2, two to the square root s log n. Um, another example is in this paper, again, it, they have a bound on this Fourier spectrum of taking C to be W squared for branching programs of width W for the permutation branching programs. And you can just use it directly to substitute it. C so gets W to the 4 times something. Um, or for read once branching programs, there is this type of bound known for C. And for AC0 circuits also, so you can take C to be log D to the log to the D of size of the circuit. So, so yeah, I mean the, the benefit, yes. C equals W squared, what does the paper give RSP, RSP? What does? What's the previous result for? Uh, the previous result was W, well this, re this paper gives you W to the four log of something plus w to the squared log of something. This one has a better dependence. This is better, depends on log n <coughs> compared to this paper. It's log squared. Yes, this, this gives, gets log squared n. This is only log n. Um, So yeah, I mean, the, 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 but the message is that this is really a general framework. You can just you don't need to know anything about these classes. You just need to know. You have to just get on on the Fourier growth. Okay, so let me just describe some open problems. These were just mostly general questions. So one way to think about this construction is that we had this fractional, this random variable x that was uh, some original pseudorandom generator. And we took t independent copies of that. So this is, let's say this is all the t independent copies. And on each, cop on each coordinate, we separately applied this specific gadget that was simulating this random walk. So there was this specific gadget that we were doing. And at the end, we were getting a pseudorandom generator for another, for the class that we were working with. Or in the work of Viola, you can pick this G to be just addition in F2. So one general question is that what are the type of gadgets that really are useful here? What, this is a, one, a random walk gadget works, addition works for polynomials. And in general, what kind of gadgets are interesting to work with with this type of, uh, with this kind of approach? Okay, so this was that. Another thing is that if you know something more about the class, the function class that you're working with, um, can you terminate your random walk earlier? Because right now what I want is that on every coordinate I want to be very close to minus one or one. I want to be epsilon over n close to minus one, one. Can you do something, can you terminate earlier if you knew something about f? We don't have any result of this one. Or another, question that might be interesting is that can you construct hitting sets with this approach with better <coughs> parameters? Because a few things break down and I don't know how you would how some construction of hit, hitting sets that would look like this. Um, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Yes. You, uh, like in the calculation that you did, you, you start from an epsilon pseudo random <coughs> function. Epsilon bias, yeah. Epsilon bias, yeah. But you yeah. kind of have this decay, right? It's like 1 over 2 to the c to the, 1 over 2 uh -huh. c to the k. So you only care about the small Fourier. Yeah, exactly. 
So you don't need to be really uniform over all the time. No. Yeah, that's why I said just almost KYs would be enough. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, yes. So that would just, if you use almost KYs, it would just give you length log log n plus log 1 or epsilon, and that is just enough. So this just, this was easier to work. So I, I, I really like the approach. Just, uh, I'm not sure how it works. So it was already known that, uh, so the, the, the free growth already implies uh, that, uh, you know, you can, uh, you can take a bottom difference distribution, add some noise, or take restrictions, and fool the function. And they, yes. that also gives you a generic way to, to just repeat. So, so once you restrict, if you just keep restricting, you, you, you end up with a function, you know, constant number of bits, and just fool it. So, um, and that's this is a much weaker assumption. I'm only looking at L1 norm instead of. But L1 norm uh, is, is all that, that you need for that, right? I mean, to, to and this L bound down L1 norm doesn't give anything about random restriction. I thought it does. Okay, maybe you can take Even to take the parity function and satisfy this. Mm -hmm. Usually, you, you need to prove that it works also for pseudo random. For example, for SC0, you need to de randomize the switching layer minor to prove mm -hmm. what you say. Yeah. So it's not so clear that uh, there is like this black box theorem for the identity of some theorem. Okay, maybe. So you fun. need to show that like, K wise restrictions also simplify your function, right? If you, you want to repeat this K wise plus. Why well, don't need to simplify it? I'm just going to restrict the, the number of bits that I'm working with. You know, if I, after oh. the restriction, I'm just going to be on fewer bits and I just apply the process there. Um, I'm not doing anything, I'm just simplifying here. I'm just, I'm just reducing the input length every time. What, where's the no work? How do you choose this? Bits? How do you choose the restriction? Oh, I see. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I see. So that's, uh, that's the thing. Okay. So okay, you don't need to choose the restriction in any fancy way. I see. OK. So that, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. OK. All right, thanks. Yes. Yeah, maybe a, a higher level question. It seems that uh, you know, the, there's a lot of power that's revealed recently about random walks inside the cube. There's this yaw is out here. There's a uh, few years ago, Shapar <coughs> and Bumeka used it to give an algorithmic proof of uh, the Spencer six degrees of separation. In some sense, there are six standard deviations. <laughs> and now uh, these uh, results about biased uh, GMP models of uh, Chatterjee and then one and done. Uh, which also work by the. So, do you see any any commonality and uh, you know some no general framework that can incorporate them all or fully as pseudo random? Yeah, methods? yeah, I don't know. That's a hard question. <laughs> I don't know to say. I would really like to construct some other pseudo random objects with this framework. Maybe could it be useful to construct I don't know expanders or anything? I mean. Because all of these also, you can formulate some fractional version of those pseudo-random objects. And it's just the general question that if you have a suitable fractional pseudo-random object, how can you convert it to a standard one? Because here, the most important thing about this is that the high dimensional object. So you're only working with each dimension uh, independently. But for these other things, like expanders and stuff, I don't know. And in general, I don't have any big picture view of how does this fit to other ones. <coughs> All right, so let's thank Kaveh again.